Welcome to the Rights Track Podcast, where we aim to get the hard facts about the human rights challenges facing the world today. I'm Todd Landman, and in today's episode, we're asking how do we count victims of torture? My guest is Will Moore, professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies at Arizona State University, and one of the lead researchers on the Ill Treatment and Torture Data Collection Project, which has taken a unique approach to this challenging question. So welcome, Will, and thank you for joining us on this Transatlantic Podcast. I have a very straightforward question to start, which is, what are the key challenges associated with counting instances of torture? Thank you. That concern, that challenge, very directly influenced Courtney Conrad, my uh, co-principal investigator on the project, and I when we when we launched it. It is a poorly recognized fact that we will never be able to observe all of the torture events that occur. I, I think in this particular area, torture people are are more aware of that than they are in topics such as protest and other sorts of things. But we simply cannot count the number of instances. And the, the, the reasons are fairly straightforward. The actors that commit these violations don't want us to be able to. And many, well, certainly most violations of the Convention Against Torture take place inside walls, um, inside prison cells, inside other kinds of structures where they're hidden away. Some events do occur in public, of course, but most do not. And so there's an unobservable layer of activity. And what we're interested in as uh, activists, as, as scholars, as human beings, is trying to figure out Given that we know we can't observe what actually happens, how can we best try to estimate what happens? We launched the project with an effort to try to move people in that direction because, frankly, that is not the current status quo of how academics go about observing it. So, so how have human rights groups and other agencies, including academic institutions, traditionally tried to count either victims of torture or instances of torture. What, what were the sort of traditional methods for doing that? Well, so let's, let's start with, you know, Amnesty International back in the 1970s really is the first to launch a, a systematic effort with a global report on torture, which then produces some annual reports where they begin to identify circumstances where they can validate by their procedures that an event has occurred, by which we mean a violation of uh, the Convention Against Torture didn't exist back then, but it would later come along in 1984, and they were a big advocate for that. The United States State Department, starting in the late 1970s, began to also issue an annual report, not just about torture, but about uh, rights violations in general, particularly focused on physical integrity rights and civil and political rights. And those reports were reports of known instances. At Purdue University, there was a group of, of researchers that began to get interest in trying to take those written documents and produce num numeric measures, uh, ordinal, which is, you know, one, two, three, or four values to allow comparisons to start to be made. So these were sort of scales. So you took a text, a narrative, and you, you assigned a scale or a score to that narrative about, you know, the egregiousness, if you will, of certain things taking place in countries. Is that the sort of approach they adopted? That's exactly right. I've never had conversations with any of the original People, I mean, I know them, but I've never actually talked with them about what I call this fundamental problem of unobservability. I think they were aware of it, but in the interests of making some progress, uh, because these scales certainly do stimulate. This is one of these differences between, you know, what people refer to as basic research and more applied research. The, the basic research that was done initially was flawed. I think the people who were doing it recognized it. I certainly recognized it way back in graduate school in the late 1980s, but I couldn't think of a solution. So let me try to be a little more clear about what the flaw is. The flaw in that approach is to treat those narrative texts 
as if they are reports of all that has happened, because they are not. They're, in fact, reports of allegations that have been validated. These are the known, you know, to, to quote uh, the, the Secretary of Defense from the Bush administration, these are the known known. <laughs> Right? Yes. If all we do is count the known knowns, we have a tendency to want to treat them as if that's the actual level of violation. And those two are not the same, unfortunately. The project that that we began took that as given and said, well, look, we can code reliably and validly because of what's called content analysis, where you go through and and, uh, assign values to text. We can reliably and validly code what Amnesty International alleged. What we then want to try to do is figure out, come up with creative ways to take that information to develop an estimate of what actually happened. So you're using information that you knew about the world to say a little something about information you did not know, the classic definition of making an inference, right? So how did you go about doing that? How how did you do that, and how was it different than what these folks at Purdue were doing? The approach that we are taking in in our project, and it's important to to emphasize that in our data collection, we're only changing the conceptual definition of what it is that we're trying to code. So if you were to download the ITT data, and it's available at a couple of, there's a project website, and I also have a a website at at a place called Dataverse, and you can download it from either of those two locations. But if you were to download that, you're not going to get any estimates of what has happened. You're just going to get the our counting of what Amnesty International has alleged. And I can talk a little bit about um, about what some of the different things in there are. It's then up to the user to try to figure out how they want to make use of that data to draw inferences. There are a couple of different approaches that one might take from a statistical modeling perspective. We are not the only ones, those of us doing human rights research, with that face this problem. This is a generic problem that human beings face, is we often have some information available to us. We know we don't have the full information, and we want to see, is there some way I can leverage the information I have to get a reasonable estimate of the full information, right? As you pointed yes. out earlier, the classic problem of inference. And so what we've done is leaned on some which is what you tend to do in academia. You lean on the the insights and efforts of other people working in other fields, um, in this case, some people in statistics, to develop more complex statistical models than uh, are currently being used in the literature to draw inferences about what states are actually doing given the information that we know is available. So I understand that. I understand the fact that, you know, country by country, you could do that. But it was interesting. I I looked at your website and uh, I looked at the publications uh, link on the website for the ITT project. And you have a link there to um, a uh, a blog post from a fellow scholar named Chad Clay. And one of the things Chad, one of the things he raises is, uh, an issue about Amnesty's selective focus on certain countries. So I can see how this might work country by country. If you're interested in torture in Brazil over a certain period, you might be able to use a statistical technique to estimate the torture practice from the allegations that Amnesty's made. But it may be that Amnesty didn't focus on Bolivia somewhere close to Brazil. They only looked at Brazil that year, or there was less emphasis on Bolivia and you know, Costa Rica that year. So how do you control for that selective focus that Amnesty might have, given their priorities as an NGO, and that they may be only reporting on the countries of interest to them that year? And there's a sort of natural, what we would call selection bias in the way they're producing these international reports. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Chad's post is at a website called Quantitative Peace, and, and he really does a, a great job producing some maps that might interest some people that show what it is that our data ends up coding. So the, the approach to that problem is to tackle it exactly as you're suggesting, which is to, you mentioned countries, there's also time. And uh, in the work that Courtney and I have done 
uh, which is unpublished at this point, we use the country year as the unit that we're going to want to work with. So Bolivia 1996 and so forth. And so Bolivia 1997, Bolivia 1998. And what you want to do is to develop a model that can predict reasonably well whether or not amnesty observed much or very little of the abuses of the Convention Against Torture that took place in that country in that year. And that's precisely what we do. And so in this unpublished paper that uh, a guy also at the University of Georgia, one of Chad's colleagues, a guy named Danny Hill, what we do is we have a model that produces an estimate for every country and every year, a unique estimate of the likelihood of amnesty seeing a violation if it occurred. So that corrects for some of the bias that might, you know, turn up in the raw data. That's exactly right. And yeah. um, so if if Amnesty, if our model estimates that Amnesty observed only 10% of the violations that occurred, then that model's going to take that into consideration when trying to estimate how different political institutions, such as whether or not a country has elections or whether or not the country has a powerful court that can check the executive, uh, those are the primary variables that we tend that we happen to be interested in in that project. So, could you tell? Could you? So, if somebody said to you, "Yeah, is torture in Latin America getting better or worse over time, or is torture in the Middle East getting better or worse over time?" Can your data set answer questions like that? Certainly not from just downloading our data. No, they can't. So, you need a statistical model to do that work for you. That's exactly right. Okay, and okay. that's, you know, this is something that Courtney and I, we started this back in 2007. And one of the things that I'm very interested to learn over the coming years is the extent to which people work with the data, because the unpleasant truth is it's complicated. Under the old approach that everybody took to data sets like the political terror scale or the Sanguinelli and Richards CIRI, it's usually pronounced Siri data, was they they took that and treated it as if, and there was no reason they shouldn't have, given if you go and read the materials, treated it as if it was a scale that allowed you to examine the level of violation in different places. In some very rough sense, you can do that, but the more precise you want to get about trying to do that, the more and more it falls apart. Because Amnesty International makes no bones about the fact that they are a political advocacy group. And if you talk with people at Amnesty, as we've done, about the process by which they produce allegations, they're not only trying to make sure that they report actual violations that meet a standard, a, a legal, an international legal standard that they feel confident about this allegation. It's the type of allegation that they would be willing to bring in a court case. It's not just something that, well, we think this, this might have happened or we think this probably has happened. So that's one standard that they're trying to meet. On the other side of it, though, they have to take into consideration factors like are how will our uh, membership respond? Will this allegation help us draw attention that is going to bring pressure against the government that is involved? So there's, there's a political calculation that has both a mobilization component where they think about their base and their researchers and they need to keep, remember, it's a volunteer organization. They need to pe keep people engaged. So they need to you know, strike a balance between crying wolf too often and not speaking truth to power, right? So you've got to try to try to strike a balance between those two extremes while also taking into consideration that amnesty has limited resources. How often do they want to, you know, draw attention to a problem where they know the government is not going to be responsive when they could instead push that, uh, some of that energy and some of those person hours and advocacy effort in a direction where they think they might have more bang for their buck. So that's really interesting, right? These, these other factors that are determining in some ways what we might call the data generating process, right? So they, yeah, yeah, so they're out there looking for things where they think that this is a good way to invest our resource and to lobby those sorts of areas where we think we might get positive change. 
That's right. And they, they have those conversations and debates. Human Rights Watch does it. They had a, a wonderful video where they took it through the process where these two uh, researchers sneak in across the border into Syria, collect a bunch of stories, and then they take you and they allow you inside where they had the meeting about which of the stories to use, how to use them. Because another thing that these organizations will do is lobby privately, right? They may not make an allegation public. They may choose to keep it quiet because they think it's going to be more effective to lobby uh, in usually uh, lower levels of a given government, whether that's a, trying to get a government to take pressure um, as a third party or trying to get someone in the government itself to bring pressure, whether that's a bureaucrat or a military official or a, a diplomat or a member of the executive branch. So, so with all these data then, I mean, you have a base data set that anyone could download from the ITT data set, but then they need to add value to that data by engaging in some of the statistical modeling, uncovering patterns, overcoming some of the natural biases in the data set and making something, a story, if you will, out of that using, uh, uh, you know, social scientific methods. And then the, any estimate that one would make, of course, out of those data would, would have what we would call a margin of error, right? So that you would have some sort of sense that it was greater in this country than that country. And you might even be able to say it was statistically, uh, you know, greater in this country than that country. But you wouldn't have a kind of precise count just from where we started in the beginning of this chat. Um, you know, getting at a precise count of the number of instances of torture or even victims of torture is, is in many ways an elusive goal. Uh, what you're really trying to do is a get a, an estimate of the general patterns of things that are happening. That's exactly right. There's a second use I want to point out that, uh, that I hope some, I don't plan to take it up. I don't think Courtney does, but I, it would be neat to see someone do it because what we've done is gone into a much more detail than existing projects looking at a very high profile advocacy group on their main topic, which is Amnesty International on ill treatment and torture. So someone who's interested in studying Amnesty's behavior could use our data as is. There's no need to develop, right? Because those data are account of that. And unlike the previous projects, which have uh, only coded read and, 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 and uh, coded the annual reports, from 1995 to 2005, we have coded every single amnesty release, okay, and codified it by type. And then we've also gone into a great deal more depth about the specifics of the allegation. One of the things we didn't really anticipate when we started the project was that amnesty will report on government responses to amnesty's complaints, which happens from time to time. They report on occasionally people get fired or investigations are open. Occasionally court cases take place. So there's all sorts of information that has been collected over uh, a little over a decade's time period. And, and by the way, 9-11 occurs right in the middle of it. And that influenced our, our choice. We thought that 9-11 might be an interesting, I don't know that it actually is, but it might be an interesting transition time in, in terms of people's perceptions, particularly people in the West, about government use of that form of abuse. So those, those last two things I want to bring together in a, in, a, in a rather killer question for you, which is to say, you were talking about amnesty. You talked about 9-11 a little bit. And I, I want to know, did you, did you read at all any of the CIA torture report? And I'm curious if you have any, any things you might want to share with us about that. Because the CIA torture report revealed to many human rights uh, uh, activists and scholars that which we knew was taking place, but, you know, did, you had, had sort of, uh, you know, sort of a reports here and there about it, but the report that really came out last year really, really said, this is what's happened, uh, and this is what everyone thought we knew was happening, but now we have proof that it has happened. And I'm just curious what your reactions were to that report. The Senate Armed Service Committee did a report in 07, maybe 06, I'm not sure, that has an awful lot of that information. And one thing that it really does a nice job of doing, um, which is different from the CIA report, but what it does a really neat job of doing is helping us understand how the 
Judge Advocate General JAG, which is a is an attorney for the uh, for the military. How those people responded to the infamous memo that Donald Rumsfeld, the Secretary for Defense, sent down when there was a there was a meeting in the White House that President Bush convened, which started this whole what they call enhanced interrogation program, and and we actually know, courtesy of this report, a great deal about it. Jane Meyer writes uh, at the New Yorker has written a book that documents it well. So then the CIA report comes out and just fills in some more detail about the abuse that the agency engaged in, most of which took place outside of the United States. And I don't mean outside of the United States in Abu Ghraib, but outside of the United States in, in, in other countries. So I suppose that, you know, the positive takeaway is that in a country like the United States with Freedom of Information Act and, and other sorts of things, years after the fact, we're going, we will get well-documented information of this sort of abuse. The troubling part of it is, if, you, if you're going to rely upon public opinion, which is the, the, the centerpiece of democracy, to act as a bulwark against this, 9-11 makes it terribly clear, the response in the United States and in other countries makes it terribly clear how ineffective it is. And I don't know if you might have seen it, but in 2014, Amnesty released a, a report um, saying, hey, everybody, we're not paying enough attention to torture. And one of the things that they did was did a, a survey of the public in, I don't know, 35 different countries. And there have been similar academic efforts as an outfit out of the University of Maryland that's done a couple of these. And it, it gets as high as 74% of the population if you ask the question, do you approve of torture to save lives or to protect people against terror attacks and crime? And you can get in as high in China at 74 percent and in India, it's 74 percent. In the United States, it hovers around 50 percent. It's interesting that in, uh, in countries like Greece, where you've had a, a long history of well-documented abuse, it's extremely low. Uh, so throughout Southern Europe, it's lower than it tends to be elsewhere. So that's interesting. Perhaps, you know, countries that had experienced in a, an authoritarian past of some kind, uh, the Greek generals, uh, Salazar in Portugal, Franco in Spain, those mass publics during the democratic period might be less supportive of the use of torture than, let's say, uh, mass publics in the United States that haven't experienced direct authoritarian rule in in that way. Is that right? Yeah, that appear. I, I don't want to quite punch it that strongly because yeah. uh, it it looks like and, and it's a it's an area where I hope some people will do some research because we really don't have much cross national research on public opinion about about yeah. this form of abuse. It's really compelling. Absolutely compelling. So. Um, I, I'm going to draw things just to, to, to a bit of a close here, Will, um, and we're very grateful for you sharing, sharing your insights on this project because it's a very meticulous project that's collected a particular kind of data. I think the, um, this, this thing about uh, the, the fundamental problem of unobservable uh, uh, phenomena is, is absolutely essential, and, and a lot of science is doing this, right? A lot of social science, but also natural science is trying to capture you know, inferences about things that we don't directly observe. Uh, this is a standard problem of fundamental uh, problem of, of analysis and science, but you and, and your collaborators uh, have come together and produced a data set that other people can use. They can download the data. It's publicly available and your procedures are publicly known so people can, can replicate what you've done, but also uh, do secondary analysis and extend things uh, with the data set you've got. We wanted to really push that openness, replicability to as far as possible. So one of the rules we established was that all, you know, when we, we had a conversation, one of the things that Courtney did was then created minutes. Um, and then all other communication was done by email. And we've deposited all of those emails. Um, I don't imagine anybody's ever going to want to read them. I know I would not want to, but uh, we, we really pushed it to make it as as open and transparent as possible so that people could literally read through the debates about coding decisions and all those sorts of things. I think that's excellent because oftentimes we're presented with data sets where we just accept the coding that's been been uh, you know achieved by the team without without having insight into that sort of deliberative process. So 
Uh, it's a fascinating project. It clearly shows where careful thinking has gone into taking uh, a step further in data analysis around, around the issue of torture, that you took some of the early insights from the Purdue project and other projects and created something a bit different, uh, that, that, that there's this uh, commitment to transparency and accountability around the project, and it's not over, right? You're still working on the data. You're finding new things to estimate with it, and you hope that other scholars use it in that way as well. Indeed, yeah. So that's fantastic. I mean, that's, that's absolutely fantastic in what the scientific process should be. Um, so with that, I think I just wanted to thank you for joining us tonight, Will, and uh, wish you the very best for, uh, for the future of your research and uh, the way in which you stay committed to the human rights cause. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for starting this podcast. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm delighted to be on and I look forward to future editions. We're really excited to bring all these podcasts to the public domain. So for now, I want to say good night and thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Rights Track. This episode of The Rights Track was presented by Todd Landman and produced by Chris Garrington of Research Podcasts. The project is funded by the Nuffield Foundation and you can find additional information and resources at www.rightstrack.org.